What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another Gravity Falls video. Today, I have a very special video for you. In, for you, don't know why this always happens when I try to do introductions to videos, but yes, I have something very special to go through today. We are not actually going to be going through some of the previous episodes that we've just watched. We're actually going to explore a different type of media that's come out of Gravity Falls, and that is the books. So there are some very popular books, for example, Journal 3 and Book of Bill, which came out fairly recently. I think there are still um, there's still an ARG that's ongoing with that, which I hope to get to eventually. I think we're still a little bit um, far away from that, but I would love to get to Book of Bill at some point. But there's also one book which came out at the point at which, um, okay, let me restart that sentence. If you didn't know, I am on episode six of season two, or I'm, I'm about to go into episode seven. But during this period before episode six and seven uh, was actually a book release. Um, because, of course, each episode, uh, ba basically season two was over a span of like two years, apparently. And I can't imagine what the weights were like for that. So in between, there were like mini shorts and there were uh, books and stuff like that. There, there were a lot of different things to kind of, to make sure that the, 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 they were filling the gaps, right? And I want to read through the book that came out between these episodes that apparently not many people actually know about. Like some people haven't even read this book that are in the community. So... Fine. Uh, I just kind of want to go through as much as I can. And I have talked to my community a lot in Discord. And apparently there, there aren't any spoilers uh, for the rest of season two in this. So I should be good to get straight in there. And this book has a lot of secret codes in. So you've probably already seen I have a, I have a pen, my trusty biro. And I have a literal pad here. <laughs> And I'm going to be writing like ciphers and stuff on here. Um, and we're going to try to see what's in this book. Uh, I, I'm not going to go super in depth. I'm going to solve any cipher that I see come to me. Um, but we are going to, we, we are going to have a look through the whole book today. And I'm going to see what I can find, basically. So... Let's just get straight in. Actually, no, let's not. What you guys may not realize is that in each of my videos on Gravity Falls, and I've also been doing it a little bit uh, for my other videos whenever they come out as well, is I have this kind of Gravity Falls-esque ending, um, this kind of credit scene. I, I've been thinking about putting all my members on this, on this, credit, on this credit screen, but there are a lot of members, so <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. Um, there is this secret code and people um, it, people find it their mission to kind of find what this code means and stuff. And there are a lot of great comments in here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find one uh, over here. Who was it? Oh, yeah, this one. DJ Leonard, I think, was one of the first people to find it, which is amazing. Uh, code on the green screen says first frame top left, which has the visionaire key, which has the visionaire key type and the end cipher says next and mystery and nonstop fun. God, I can't talk today. So basically in order to solve this code, you're gonna need to uh, see my me me over here. Here we go. And then there there is the code in the green screen. And if you shift that back three letters, then you find first frame top left. And then if you go all the way to the first frame of the video and you look in the top left, it says type and that's your key. And then you can use that key, uh, Visionaire Cypher, to solve that code. And it says next, um, mystery and non-stop fun. That was a little teaser that we're going to be covering this book today. Because this book is called Dipper's Guide, or Dipper and Mabel's Guide to mystery and non-stop fun. So, it is 149 pages long. The authors of it are Dipper and Mabel themselves. Great. It, I, I can already see it says secret codes and more. Secret codes are probably what I'm going to be looking for the most. 
But um, we're just going to get straight into it. Um, I'm hoping uh, there aren't going to be too much, but like I, I have actually looked at a few pages in the on in the front of the book, and uh, <laughs> this is a funny one. I think this might be a code. More on codes later. How on earth could this be a code? How on earth? There aren't there aren't four thousand eight hundred and forty seven letters in the alphabet. This is not an A one Z twenty six. Um. So that's interesting that they're pointing out that this could be a code. All rights reserved, blah, blah, blah. Love that. I love that they're really creative with this, you know. Um, like even with like the copyright stuff, they're putting little notes like Mabel's going blah, 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 whatever. Um, written by Dipper Pines and Mabel Pines with help from Rob Renzetti and Shane Houghton. <laughs> Houghton. Uh, based on the series created by Alex Hirsch. Cool. So nothing else here, really. And then some lines. Okay. So here's the introduction, right? So to, to whatever intrepid mystery hunter gets their hands on this book, my name is Dipper Pint. Doing my summer in the strange town of Gravity Falls. <laughs> I don't know how to do his voice. Maybe it's like, doing the, doing the summer in the strange town of Gravity Falls. That's more Bill. I don't know. I don't know how to do Dipper's voice. Um, by the way... I have ordered a Dipper Pines hat, so I'm going to have a hat soon um, because people say that I look a little bit like Dipper, which I, I don't see it personally. It's probably just the hair. Um, uh, during my summer in the strange town of Gravity Falls, I've seen so many paranormal and baffling things that I could fill up my entire book. Lucky for me and for you, I found this cursed empty old book in the attic of the mystery shack. By the time I'm done writing and you're, re uh, and you're done reading, you'll have all you need to know to become a world-class paranormal expert like myself. In addition, if I'm kidnapped, blasted into another dimension, turned to stone, or taken by forces I can't imagine, I may call on you to save me one day, so take notes. See, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if this sort of thing is foreshadowing. Uh, and I, I, I kind of wonder... Um, not necessarily the canonicity of this book, because this book is is official and it's being written by Dipper and Mabel, so of course it's canon. But like, is this stuff actually going to be foreshadowing? And are there going to be codes in here that actually help me with the lore? That's my big question going into this. Um, lol. <laughs> hey there, Mabel Pines here. I had to jump on Dipper's bed for half an hour. Oh wait, no, full half hour before he agreed to let me co-author his book. And lucky for you, the fun factor of this little project just skyrocketed 1,010%. If you read my sections, and why wouldn't you? You'll learn everything you need to know to become the funniest kid in the neighborhood, your town, and maybe, just maybe, the whole world. I apologize in advance for my sister's part <laughs> participation in this book. Participation. I really like this because it appeals to different audiences as well. Or, not different audiences, it appears to both audience, audiences of people who are like Dipper and people who are like Mabel. In this world, you're either a Dipper or a Mabel. No, that's not true, I'm both. Um, basically, a lot, of, a lot of kids will see Gravity Falls and they'll be like, yeah, Gravity Falls is a fun little series. I love the animated part of it. I love all of the um, adventures that, it, that they get up to every episode, right? They're, they're, like, they're probably like a season one -er. Um, and they really just enjoy and relate to Mabel. And so they'll probably pick up this book and they'll probably just read it normally and, and they'll enjoy reading through it uh, and seeing all of Mabel's parts and seeing all of the fun little things that they, they go through. Uh, and I'm assuming this is like an interactive book as well, a little bit like the survival logbook in FNAF. Uh, I don't know if it is or not. I think um, it would be cool if it is. But then, of course, you have that part of the survival log, but you have, you have Dipper, you have Dipper's part, you have a lot of people that are coming to Gravity Falls for the mystery, a little bit like me, solving codes and going through and trying to find easter eggs and stuff, so you kind of get the best of both worlds in this, which I really enjoy about the author. Uh, I'm not going to read everything here, um, oh, of course, I, I do want to go through a lot of the secrets in a later analysis video, maybe, if if you guys would like that. But uh, Oregon seems pretty, um, it seems pretty, oh, that's weird. 
Um, the Legend of the Gobblewonka and the Curious Case of the Beheaded Waxman. Oh, that's episode two and three. Okay, fine. Legendary Adventures, which you can read more about in the Home and Garden section of the Gravity Falls Gossiper. Okay. He's been awarded the Distinguished President's Key. That's true. And had his bedtime pushed back from 9 to 10.30 in recognition of his achievements. This guy! Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing is, uh, Dipper wrote this. It, it, it's really cool. It, it kind of goes back to the survival logbook as well, where... You see like faded text and you see uh, altered text and then you see red pen text and you know the red pen is Michael and the other two are different characters. So I really like that um, it's clear who's Dipper and who's Mabel here. Mabel writes in pink and has like rainbows and stuff everywhere. So this is clearly written by Dipper if we're, if we're going by that logic. Um, so Dipper Pines wrote about himself and then Mabel crossed it out and said darkness. And this guy. Um, okay, cool. Uh, and then about the cooler author. Yeah, Mabel wrote her own part too. Mabel Pines is qualified to write about fun because she is the most fun person in the world. As evidence, I'm not going to make you read a big long bio like some people, but instead, here's a drawing of a cute cat balancing on a giant strawberry. Or maybe it's a tiny cat on a regular size strawberry. You decide. <laughs> is that Garfield? Is that Garfield? Do not lick this chocolate stain. I'm saving it for later. Okay, bro. Wow. Okay. So this, this book is pretty huge. Um, we're just at the contents page. So allies and enemies is something supernatural going on. Preparing for your supernatural encounter. Gravity falls and other places to be paranoid. Monsters and ghosts. This is unnatural, supernatural. What to do when the monster is you. The trouble with time travel codes, curses, and other secret stuff. Congratulations. See, the thing about this is I don't think that you need to go through this systematically. I don't, I don't think you need to read through page by page. I think you can just skip to any page. I, I think it's literally just a guide. Well, it is. It is a guide. It's a guide to mystery and all that fun. Here's what I want to do. Uh, and I'm really sorry if you want me to go through this one chapter at a time, but I want to go straight to trouble with time travel because that really intrigues me. Um, it, it might talk about blending a little bit, uh, and I, I'm curious about blending. Um, so what page? 107. Okay. Oh, already we have this baby. Interesting that they got a photo of it. Um, how to avoid paradoxes, alternate time streams, and your past self. I love this. Time travel seems like a great idea, right? If you could... Why not travel past that big test you have on Friday and see what all the right answers are? Or leap back to the first day of school and start over? Or better yet, why not go back to the start of the summer and avoid school entirely for three months? That sounds like a great idea, but what do you do when you run into yourself on opening day at the public pool? Time travel comes with a lot of problems, paradoxes and mind-numbing math. Puzzling through it all can give the novice traveller a horrible headache, referred to as a time grain. <laughs> Luckily for you, I've done my fair share of leaping, voyaging, trekking. Write me if you have any suggestions for a cooler term than just time traveling. Anyway, I've learnt the tricks of time travel trade the hard way, and you are about to reap the rewards of all my experience. After reading this, you should have all you need to know to avoid the pitfalls and become a successful leaper, voyager, trekker, journeyer. <laughs> okay, cool. That's a really cool introduction, and I really like that they talk about they they're quite open about talking about the paradox of time travel. What do you what do you do if you see yourself in the past? Um, is does that blow up the universe? Like like what what? That's that's the problem with time travel. Um, and the other problem is like if time travel did exist in the future, then that would technically mean it existed in the past. So why haven't we met time travelers yet? It's it's a weird thing. It's it's time travel is strange uh, and that's why uh, I don't believe it's possible I think time is a it's a straight line time's arrow um, so let's move on from this and see what we've got oh I love this blend in okay the first part of successful time travel is knowing let me let me let me just write this down the first part of time travel is knowing how to travel, of course. Well, the easiest way to travel is to get your hands on the time travel device, figure one. Doesn't sound easy, does it? Luckily for us, there are some pretty incompetent time travelers out there, figure two. 
and they always seem to be dropping their devices. Okay, so we've got Blendin, Blandin, literally Blendin, literally Blendin in. Uh, and then this is the, um, oh, I wonder if we can see this text. I wonder if you brighten it. Hmm, I don't know. <clears throat> Let's examine this time travel device. It looks like a normal tape measure, right? But if you look more closely, you'll... <laughs> Okay, okay. Sorry to all those reading this chapter. How can I explain this? Okay, it's Dipper. Writing this, but not the Dipper who started uh, writing this chapter. I'm Dipper from the future. I had to leap back in time. Decided to go with Leaping and Leaper. <laughs> and stop my past self from giving you all the secrets of time travel. Oh, this is cool. Oh my gosh. Okay. I come from the... Uh, Cal calamitous future. Cal calamitous. Can't read. Calamitous future, where time travel knowledge is common. Everyone is constantly leaping back to fix every little mistake or leaping forward to see what happens on their favorite TV show. Paradoxes keep piling up and there are so many alternate timelines. This is giving me low-key vibes. <laughs> like, you, you, gotta, you gotta go to the time variance authority and fix all your mistakes. Um, so how... Is there a way to solve this? You just blank blank, get a blank, then blank 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 blank, everything blank blank, further blank blank, future. You just get a then everything further future, there's past hard, secret, you fourth easy. It's It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so here's my first test going into this book. Do we screenshot this and Photoshop it? Do we turn up the exposure? I'm gonna try that. All right, we just need to take this screenshot, go into Photoshop, drop it there, and then make it a little bit bigger so that we can see it. Okay, so at this point, you can't see anything, right? Because it's it's all just black rectangles. But my, my question is, basically, uh, Scott Cawthon did this a lot uh, as well, is you can make something look almost pitch black because black is like it's really hard to distinguish um a really 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 dark gray from a, a completely pitch black um and so but uh, but of course if you change like the contrast on that and, and if you up the exposure you can see the difference so i'm hoping if i turn up the exposure on this image we're going to see some words <sighs> okay, I think I was completely wrong. I mean, that, that's not really doing anything. Um, contrast. No, I'm not seeing any words. That's weird. How do we... I don't know. I don't know how you solve that. Like, it, can it be solved? Is my question as well. Um, and please, no backseating. I, I don't want to be told if this can be solved or not, because I want to solve it myself unless I ask you directly for help. But I don't know how to solve that. Um, and I'm assuming this isn't just like, ran this isn't random, because why... Why would I want to buy a book with two random pages? This chapter edited by Blendin Blandin from the Time Anomaly Removal Crew. Oh, I see. So, so we need to, ah, I see. Okay, so <laughs> this is farther in the future, Dipper, and in, in my time of all the troubles. Well, before I run out of time, I will explain the secret to time travel. You don't need to get a time travel device. You can create your own if you know this one basic principle of fourth dimensional quantum quasar physics. <laughs> quantum quasar physics. That is completely BS. Uh, don't worry, it's very easy to learn. Yeah, so this is telling us how to time travel, but I think it's just blocked out. And I don't think it's like a secret code then. I, I think it's probably just baloney you know i i think they it, it's just a joke um so fine um here we go i'm seeing some familiar symbols here okay um 
So here's Mabel's not hard, really easy, totally obvious guide to time travel. One, sit in a chair. Two, look at a clock. Three, you are traveling through time at a rate of 60 seconds per minute. Good joke, Mabel. Good one. That is good. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to save these codes. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty. Of, yeah, that. Oh my gosh, there are so many. There's so many. Um, well, here we go. Codes, curses, and other secret stuff. I've come to the right place. Okay. So apparently time travel is a secret that I'm not going to be able to share with you guys, but perhaps my future selves and the time anomaly removal crew will allow me to write a chapter on some other secrety bits that won't affect the space-time continuum. Yes? We're good? Okay. <laughs> Great. What I should have done is written the previous chapter in code so the future spoil sports couldn't ruin it. Ah, but it's too late for that. See, this is why time travel is so useful. Maybe I should go back and... Never mind. Moving on. Not writing about time travel. Go to the next page and we'll talk about codes. This is something I've wa uh, wondered for a while, right? Is who, who, if anyone, is writing these codes in the episodes and in the credits? Like, is there an actual fourth dimensional break? It, that's, that's my question to you. Because if you think about what codes are, and I'm sure it's actually gonna go through this in the history of codes, and I've been doing a little bit of research on this, um, when I've been writing my my video going through the Visionaire cipher is the history of like encryption and uh, just cryptology in general is that you have kind of two parties and you want to send a code to one party without the other party being able to obstruct and being able to get that knowledge of how to solve that code. You kind of want a safe, secure, uh, encrypted communication um, that uh, and that is used like that that was used by like Julius Caesar that's why it's called the Caesar cipher is because Julius Caesar actually used it himself in his armies um, and he and he said like you know A Z to B no not A Z to B I don't know I don't know he just said like random letters and to the opposing side, it just sounded like random letters, but to the 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 actual to Julius Caesar's army, um, it it was an encrypted message, and they were be they were able to decrypt it, and they were able to get orders from that, and that's that's um, that's why it's called the Caesar cipher, and it's really interesting. Uh, the ability to translate your message into a secret and confusing language is called cryptography. There we go. The more confusing it is, the more powerful it is. Just remember to always use this ancient power for good and never for evil, for super evil or for little Gideon. So, yeah, my question is like, and my theory is, are these codes written to us from the future? Like maybe a future dipper um, or like blend in or are they written by Bill Cipher? Like... I feel like there's something going on with all of these codes that it, I feel like it's just more, it's more than the codes, right? I think there could be law behind the codes. It's quite interesting to think about at least. Nerd alert, Mabel here. I'm going to spruce up Dipper's dry page of history with some fun Mabel edits. <laughs> as long as there have been secrets, there have been codes, possibly dating back as far as 500 BC. Bam, 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 bam. Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. I actually think Julius Caesar was 100 BC, but never mind. Um, yes, before Christ, um, there were that. That's the origin of crypto uh, of cryptology, cryptography. They're the same thing. Um, but that's that's quite interesting that they're actually talking about the history of codes because that's something that I wanted to go into in one of my videos. Um, BC, what does that stand for? Boring codes. Working out how to crack a code is much like solving a puzzle, and since puzzles are fun, cracking codes has been a long form, has long been a form of fun and entertainment for people smart and cool enough to put their brain to the test. I like puzzles with cats on them. This chapter needs way more cats. <laughs> okay. Famous code. Yo, they actually give. Okay, this is cool. This is cool. All right, this is what I wanted. This is exactly what I wanted from this book. So, famous codes. 
Now the good stuff. I'm going to teach you how to crack a few codes, but you can't share this information with anyone. Remember, codes work best when they remain a secret. Excuse me? I sneezed. Okay. So we need to solve that. <laughs> I, I'm assuming that that's going to be a code. Um, so fine. Uh, Caesar cipher. So this is what we already know. Uh, this code shifts or rotates the letters of the alphabet to a new meaning. Sh or shifts or rotates? Shifts or rotates? I I know that um, obviously this this rectangular rectangular Caesar cipher where you just shift the letters along. I've seen that a lot. Um, but there there was also like a Caesar wheel, where it's essentially you have one wheel in the middle, and that has the alphabet around it. And then you have one re one wheel on the outside, and then you can almost turn the wheel a bit like like a vault, um, like kind of cracking a vault. Um, you can kind of turn the wheel in the middle, and then you can get any combination. It's like an interactive Caesar cipher. It's like you can change the key as you go, um, and that's also that's probably also really useful for Visionaire if you think about it, because you can you can then take your key and you can find out how many letters to shift by, and then you can instantly just do that, and then that's your new, that's your new Caesar cipher. Um, so this code shifts or rotates the letters of the alphabet to a new meaning, so the letter A becomes the letter B and so on. The alphabet can be shifted up to 26 different ways. Uh, I'm gonna disagree with that, I'm gonna say 25. Um, what's the point of having um, just the alphabet, because then you're, T technically all of this is written in a Caesar cipher of zero, right? Because I haven't shifted any letters at all. Um, so I think there's actually 25 different ways to shift the alphabet. But yeah, fair. <laughs> if you rotate the alphabet one place to the right, A becomes B, and the phrase Dipper is awesome becomes Eggjrabzvn. Cool. And yeah, I can see that. Um, Here's how the code works when you shift the letters 12 spots to the right, so the letter A becomes the letter M. Oh no. Are they giving me this because I'm gonna need to use it? That's my question. With this version of the Caesar cipher, this the phrase mystery shack becomes Igop et mal. Et mal, I love that. Try saying that three times fast. Igav et mal. Igav et et mal. Um or don't, you might give yourself a headache. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, that was giving me a headache. I could only do it two times. Um, now try and work this out on a piece of paper using the Caesar cipher where A equals M. See if you can solve what the following phrase says. Okay, fine. Uh, I, can, I can do that. I can do that right now. So P becomes a B, A becomes an M. What? I have BM. What? Is that is it gonna is it gonna make something? BM I have I done something wrong? P is a B, hundred percent. A is an M. What? Okay, let me just carry on. So then we got K is a W. BMW like the car. Uh <laughs> A is an M, G is an S. BMWMS. Okay, I'll come back to you when I've solved this. Oh, I know what I've done wrong. I know what I've done wrong. Um, because, just because... Oh, I've, I've been encoding. I haven't been decoding. <laughs> so, so what I'm talking about, right, is I've been doing P is up here, so that gives you a B, and then A is up here, so that gives you an M, but obviously that doesn't work. No, what you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to be decoding it, so you're actually supposed to be going backwards, and I didn't, I completely forgot that it was actually going to give me something different. So P down here is a D up here, and A down here is an O. Okay, let me solve this then. All right, boys. I've got, do you think Wendy likes me? You probably can't see that, so there's probably no point, probably no point of uh, showing that, but it's do, it's do you think uh, Wendy likes me? So uh, that's why Dipper is all about codes, because you can write secret codes to people. Um, 
being like, I have a crush on this person. Um, no, I don't think Wendy likes you in that context, in that way. Um, because, you know, I've seen episode two of season two. Uh, but there you go. Crank codes are so boring. Having a good, complicated, uncrackable code is very important, Mabel. You know what's uncrackable? My sleepy eyelids after reading this chapter. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Okay, bro. Um, oh wow, it gives you the app bash as well. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, I just want to see if this is anything. Um, so an R would go to a Q. No, I think an R would probably go to an F. And then an X would go to an L, fl, Z would go to an N. Uh, There's probably nothing unless it's three letters back, but I can't be bothered to check right now. By the way, I do have all of this coded in Excel, but I, I kind of want to do all this in, on paper for some reason. I don't really know why. Don't ask me why. So then you have the app bash cipher. This is a good recap. I think this is a good recap, right, of everything that we've we've done. So this code reverses the alphabet, so A becomes Z and B becomes Y and so on. So the thing that's wrong with the app bash cipher, and it's like, it's really, it's a really bad cipher because you don't need a key for it. <laughs> Literally every solution is the same. So, uh, I mean, as as they, as they were, um, as they're kind of saying, right? It's like, there's only one here. Here you can have one across, here you can have, what is it, 13 or 12 across. Um, this, like, there's only one option, and it's A to Z, B to Y, C to X, etc. And the thing about this, which dumb me thought was the same with, um, with the Caesar cipher, and obviously it's not, is that this is reversible, right? So you, you technically only need half of, half of this grid right here, because you know an M is going to be an N, and you know an N is going to be an M. It's, it's symmetrical, essentially. Um, so you only need th 13 columns here. Uh, this is a pretty easy code to crack, as they say. It only has one possible key. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, try solving this code using the app bash cipher. So this is going to be way easier. So it's going to be a T, and then it's going to be an R. It's going to say trust no one. Next. <laughs> I'm getting too good at this. I'm I'm not even going to check that by the way, but like I can I can already see it. I can already see that an M is here and an M is here. So if that's an N, that's going to work as no and then one because L is here twice. And we know that an M is an N straight away. So yeah, that's that's correct. Trust no one. Bam. Next one, substitution cipher. Cool. I, I love that they're going through this step by step. So substitution cipher is technically what we saw next, right? We saw the A1Z26 cipher, which is a type of substitution cipher, though very, very simple, right? It's literally what position in the alphabet does this letter come? That is the number that you're gonna write down. And I think they have it here. First example of a substitution cipher is where we'll replace the letters with numbers. What is a substitution cipher where A1 uh, and Z equals 26, also known as A1Z26? What does the following phrase say? Okay, great. We're, we're just going to, this is basically decoding practice. This is decoding class. And we're going to see if we can get it before, before we get to the end. So it's R and then O and then BB or oh, Robbie. It's going to be Robbie. Uh, Robbie is, I think, R Robbie is a, why is it going to be J? Robbie's a joke. R Robbie's a J, J. What? <laughs> I think I did it wrong. Robbie is a J E. Oh, jerk. It's jerk. Yeah. Robbie's a jerk. Okay, cool. I love that they're doing this. And like some people will see the codes at the end of the episodes and they won't know how to solve any of it. And then they'll pick up this book and then they'll go back. And, and that's the coolest part about this is like, you don't need to be like me where you're like really fascinated with this sort of stuff and you see a code and you instantly try and solve it. You do whatever you can to get there. Um, there are people out there that don't want to do that. And fair enough, like you're not a nerd like me uh, making stupid videos on the internet. Um, and so they'll pick up this book, as I say, 
and they'll see this and they'll be like, oh, I, I recognize, I recognize all of this. Maybe I should go back to the previous episodes and try and solve the codes. And then they'll do that. And, and that's, that's the coolest part about all of this. And I love how it goes through all of it step by step. Love it. Coolest thing about substitution ciphers is, is that you can swap out anything for the letters to customize your own very unique code. Here is a code I just made up. Oh my God. I swear to God, if we need to use this, I don't think we will because, oh, we, we're going to need to, aren't we? The thing about this is <laughs> you're changing letters into letters and numbers and symbols. So like, this is not, this is not good. <laughs> uh, but good job, Dipper, great job. Wow, what a confusing random code. Without this key, it would take forever and be extremely frustrating to crack this code. Actually, no, it wouldn't. Um, oh, actually, I mean, they're trying to get me to do this. Um, we, we, I, I made a video and it's like eight minutes long, but it took me like half an hour to record or something. Um, basically, I, I brute forced a substitution cipher and that was the, um, apparently it's called like the author's cipher or something, the author, author's code and it's got loads of funky symbols. It's this one that we keep seeing around. Where is it? Here, it's it's this one with all these symbols. That is a new one, by the way. That's a new letter that we haven't seen before. Uh, anyway, uh, we solved that by brute forcing it. And, and what brute forcing, by the way, that was cool. Uh, what brute forcing is, is essentially, you just kind of smack your head at the wall until you get it. Uh, and so that's what I did, and it worked. Um, and the way I did it was using frequency, uh, letter frequencies. Um, you can kind of tell, like an, like an E is the most popular letter of the alphabet. Uh, and then, you, of course, you got the other vowels. So if you see some of the symbols are coming up quite often, then you can probably tell it's an E. Uh, I, I do a lot of those, um, like the things that you find in newspapers, like the puzzles. Um, and they're really fun. They're really fun. Um, the sort of thing where like one letter is actually another, but you don't know what it is until, yeah. Um, I I love puzzles in general. Let's let's solve this then. So a six is going to be a T, and then a thingy is going to be a H, and then a seven is an I, and then a Z is probably an S. Am I right? Am I right? Yes, it is. <laughs> I think I'm there. Uh, I'm on the last word and I know what it's going to say. I've got, this is way more fun than going. And I think the last word is going to be outside. Uh, it starts with an O. The second letter is an E, which is actually a U. Yeah, it's going to be outside. <laughs> this is funny. This is great. I really like this so far. This is a really different kind of Gravity Falls content, but I, th I feel like it was made for me. <laughs> it's also just in general, a really cool guide. There's the math that we tried to solve that one time. Don't think it's changed at all, uh, but that's a cool picture to put on there. Uh, this is interesting. Let's have a read of this. Wow, wow, well, wow. Well. Old Pine Tree is really is adorable, isn't he? Watching the sentient amalgamation of skin and plasma try to write a decent book is like watching a pancake try to teach a class on astrophysics. <laughs> The only thing Dipper is an expert on is how to be in denial about the looming destruction that crawls closer toward humanity with every rotation of their planet around this underwhelming star. His simple-minded codes and supernatural tips won't help him when the rise of my nightmare realm brings forth a... Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just say it's going to be a real party. Mabel, on the other hand, her, I like fun. Uh, is another way of saying chaos, and I'm just the master of that. Here's a list of some really fun things. Pulling teeth out of a deer's mouth, asking why, until someone runs out of answers and starts sobbing uncontrollably. Bending your fingers backwards as far as you can. Ow! Did you hear that? That was good. Uh, eating childhood memories, making time stop forever, transforming into whatever form people fear the most. Silly straws, they crack me up. They're so silly. The conspiracies in this book are cute, sure, but they're just the tip of the triangle. You dig? You want to know about some real conspiracies? Can you handle some real knowledge? 
The moon landing was faked to hide the truth that the moon doesn't exist. It's a two-dimensional disc hiding alien space surveillance. Chairs have feelings and you cause them pain whenever you sit on one. Western democracy is a sham propped up by an elite cable of the super rich. Cabal, I don't know what that word is. They have a really great rec room. I play ping pong there sometimes. Global warming will eventually release something frozen in a glacier that's almost as powerful as me. Remember that thing your parents told you? The thing they said was really important and would make you feel safe and secure and help you sleep at night. They were lying. Pleasant dreams. Uh, only thing to point out here is uh, global warming will eventually release something frozen in a glacier that's almost as powerful as me. What on earth could be more powerful than Bill Cipher? Hmm. How about a Time Lord baby? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, basically we, we learnt in... What was it called? Irrational Treasure. What was that? Episode 8? Something like that of season 1. Uh, that's the one where we, we met um, the president. And in that episode, there was a newspaper. And on that newspaper were some little Easter eggs and some really funny uh, lines. And one of them was that there was a baby frozen in a glacier or something. Um, and... And in the, I think it was the episode before it, or two episodes before it, I don't, I don't remember. But in, in one of the previous episodes, we had the Time Traveler's Pig episode. And that was um, where we met Blendin and where we saw that baby, that, that time devouring baby, I think it was called. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. Anyway, it's been fun tap dancing on your heads, but I've got places to be and alternate realities to tamper with. You humans are such tiny-minded folk. You can't see the ultraviolet patterns on flowers, understand the motion of the stars, or hear the thoughts of animals. Heck, I bet you can't even figure out the code I've hidden throughout this book. I'll be back, but remember, Nostradamus was a hack. Morality is a mental cage designed by the weak. How's Annie? Bye! <laughs> <coughs> not doing that voice again i swear uh this is really cool art of bill cypher i know bill cypher is really easy to draw i mean i'll draw you for him um <coughs> but it's really cool art i really like it i just really like the style of bill cypher stuff it's just really cool okay my time is up <laughs> there you go there's my bill cypher right there Thumbnail face. Oh man, sorry about that last page, everyone. When I woke up, I tried erasing it, but it didn't work. It didn't. It doesn't look like it's written in pencil, ink, or any other substance I know of. I then tried ripping it out, but every time I tried, I started to fall asleep again. Spooky. I'm not sure what Bill Cipher is up to, but I'll just avoid reading that previous page if you haven't already. That's interesting. Uh, one thing I got a few comments about in my reaction to episode four to six, and and I really try not to read the comments all that much but sometimes people people just cannot resist telling me information like literally if you're going if you're about to tell me information don't <laughs> i i just i don't want to know i don't want to know the information unless i ask specifically for that information um but i i i heard that basically there is a really cool easter egg in episode four of season two where basically when dipper starts to see bill he actually blinks before and that kind of makes you um that that shows you that he was in a dream when he saw bill so it's almost like bill is like a dream eater or he, he like he sees you in your dreams but he can't be fully summoned unless you summon him uh, like gideon did or, or something like that like i think it's really interesting that sort of thing um so like the fact that Bill can only see, you can only see Bill in your dreams. And I, I really like that as well because that episode really had that theme of like, Dipper was really tired and he was trying so hard to get into this laptop. And then Bill fooled him into thinking that the laptop was broken and Bill did all these weird things in his dreams, but he didn't really fully know it was a dream because he was so overworked. Um, I really like that. Interestingly, we have Morse code. Now that's, that is interesting, okay? Now the reason I say that's interesting is because 
I haven't seen anything yet with Morse code um, or heard anything with Morse code. Um, so I, first of all, I, I am familiar with what Morse code is. Uh, I know it's like the beep, beep, beep. That was a U. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically you, you, you have a series of shorts and longs, and then you have, I guess, longer pauses in between for, to kind of show words or whatever. Well, I don't, I don't know how it works. Because what if I wanted to say H H H, but instead I'm actually saying I I I I I I. That is, and how do you know it's not I H I? That is weird. I've I've always wondered that about Morse code. But I guess you have like the slashes if you're writing it down. I just don't know how that would work audibly. Um. So okay, Morse code named after inventor and giant beard haver, haver. Sorry, Samuel Morse is another famous code that can be used in a variety of ways. The code is made up of dots and dashes, or dits and dars, if saying them out loud, uh, that represent different letters. Some radios or walkie-talkies can send signals and beeps or tones that you control. You can send this code with audio by making a quick dit with the tone for a dot, or a longer da for a dash. Dit, da, no wait, dit, dit, da, dit, da, da. Uh, <laughs> Man's teaching me how to beatbox. Um, you can also send this code visually by turning a flashlight on and off in similar intervals. This is fun and also confuses the heck out of fireflies. Okay, this scares me because I'm not very good with Morse code. Um, and again, the reason this scares me is because we haven't seen Morse code at all yet in the series, or at least I haven't, I haven't spotted it. Um, so it might be worth going back in the previous episode, the episodes that we just watched and, and seeing if we can find any dots and dashes or like like they said, like the like the blinking of the flashlight or maybe like Dipper closing his eyes as he's drifting off into sleep. Like that, there's plenty of things that could be Morse code. I'm just not very good at picking up on it. I, I'm not. Um, I know people are, are a lot better than me at picking up on Morse code. Um, I think I'm going to rest my eyes for just a moment. Huh. Now that's a bit suspicious. All this code cracking is making me dizzy. I'm going to rest my eyes. For... Maybe we should go back to episode four of season two and see if Dipper's blinking during those scenes where he's really tired and, and he's like trying to figure out the code on the laptop. We should see if maybe that's Morse code. I don't know. I'm, I'm just coming up with theories uh, off the top of my head. But uh, it's cool that we have Morse code here. I, I am going to take a screenshot of this or something and like put it on my wall behind uh, my desk. And, uh, and when Morse code comes up, inevitably, I'm sure it will. And, and it, it, maybe it will come up in future episodes too. Like I, I'm not... Uh, denying that uh, either, but like it's weird that Morse code is here and we haven't seen Morse code yet, so I'm a bit scared for that. This is a cool pattern, by the way. I'm 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 also quite interested in Morse code and the story of Morse code and stuff. This makes a lot of sense, by the way. This is one. This is two. You have two dots, three dots, four dots, five dots, and then you have six is one long, seven is two long. I will remember this, like. That's actually really a really cool. That's really cool. <laughs> that is really cool. Got a picture of Seuss here. Got even more codes. I'm assuming this is the code that Bill was talking about, um, because I'm I, I'm assuming like this is the faded text of the book. Um, I'm assuming Dipper didn't write this because it's not in his font. Um, Drink of the dead, ghouls spit on. Again, I'm not gonna read all of this, and I'm sorry if you're a huge Mabel fan and you want me to read all the Mabel stuff but um I I am literally just going through this like at a quite high level just kind of trying to see if there's any codes and secrets in this book and if we want to go through this again we always can um code cracking oh no I wrote this super secret message in code so Mabel couldn't read it but after drinking some of Mabel's spooky brews I can't remember the code key <laughs> Did I use the at bash cipher, the A1Z26 substitution cipher? Wait, it looks like there's a little Morse code in there too. I must have mixed all three codes to make a super code. Can you help me decode my super secret message? 
Oh boy, oh boy, this is the final boss of Gravity Falls decoding. Uh, it is not, it's like the, the first boss. Uh, but this is a boss nevertheless. So, let me write this down and then we're going to try and solve it. Unfortunately, I... <laughs> Unfortunately, I drew a massive bill cipher, so I don't have room on this page, but we're going to keep trying. Okay, so here's how I'm going to go about this. You see that there's a lot of different codes uh, or a lot of different ciphers all in one here. We got some letters, we got some numbers, and we got some dots and dashes, or some dits and dats, was it? Uh, dits and does. Uh, anyway, I think I want to start with the Morse code, because that's that's the easiest to identify right now. And then the A1Z26 cipher, um, which is going to be probably even easier, to be honest. And then we can go to the letters, because the letters could either be at bash or Caesar at any given moment. So... We kind of want to, and the thing is with Caesar is Caesar is actually going to be the hardest one here because we don't know what the key for the Caesar is. Um, so there you go. Interestingly, I don't think there's a visionaire in here. Um, so I guess this is like uh, more of a season one focus book that, rather than season two. I'm, I'm guessing journal three is just going to have every single cipher ever in the history of time. <laughs> Let me solve this code and then I'll be right back with you. Okay, I, I've just saw, solved the uh, the Morse code, and one of them, one of them. Let me see, where is it? Uh, this one up here is tickle attack, and this one down here is peanut butter. <laughs> what is this? What is this gonna be? What can it be? All right, a little bit of an update now that I've put in the substitution cipher. We have something get something something Mabel something and something for their tickle attack. Something something to put peanut butter in their... Something. So this is going to be the hard part, right? It's like, I don't know... I don't know what the Caesar cipher key is. But if I start with Atbash... It's going to be a lot easier. So let's try GL. So is GL going to turn into anything? T O 2. Okay, so it's to get something. So then Y Z X P. I don't think that's going to be anything. But Y is a B. Oh, it's actually it's actually back. Okay, to get back at Mabel, we've got, I think, yep. Yeah, to get back at Mabel. So the whole first part is actually at bash, which is quite cool. Um, at some point, I'm going to be able to get um, my camera to link up so that I can actually show you what I'm writing. I think that's going to be sick. I think that would be a really cool setup. Uh, and I think, to be honest, I think we'll probably do these book videos every once in a while. I think that this is so much fun. And as soon as you'll be able to see what I'm writing, this, this could be really good content, I think. Okay. So we've got to get back at Mabel, Candy, and Grenda for their tickle attack. Something, something to put peanut butter in their something. Interesting. I am assuming the next part is going to be Caesar, though. And Caesar is probably my least favorite right now. Uh, although, actually, that is not Caesar because I have got that. And then T, G, and then an L is an O. Oh, okay. So maybe there's... I don't think there is any Caesar in here. Uh, let me just see what this last word is. S and then O. Oh, it's going to be socks. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So the full message is to get back at Mabel, Candy, and Grenda for their tickle attack. I'm going to put peanut butter in their socks. I'm so glad I solved that. That told me everything I needed to know about the law. I think, as I say, I, I want to do more videos like this and I want to be able to show you my pen and my pen and pen. So I think I'm going to hold off on the codes right now unless I see a really interesting one that I want to do. Uh, and I want to spend like another 20 minutes or something going through like another chapter, like a chill chapter. Um, fun with allies and en you know what? Let's do allies and enemies. I really want to hear about this. Uh, if... Um, Oh, it is, I guess it's just like a character encyclopedia. Okay. 
So before you can begin your investigation, you have to learn to distinguish friend from fr from foe. Sometimes the scariest creatures you'll encounter are the normal people you meet. True. And I'm not just talking about my grunkle stand first thing in the morning, although I wish I could get that image out of my head. Here is a list of some of my allies and enemies, in case you ever encounter them yourself. Grunkle stand, distinguishing feature, mysterious fez, absurd amounts of shoulder hair, special ability can lie in 0 0.00531 seconds. Status, ally. Ah, Grunkle stand has the heart of a lion and the face of a bridge troll. <laughs> Okay, okay. Love this uh, cat stan as well. I cat stan it. That was a really bad joke, I'm sorry. Uh, Seuss, distinguishing feature, large stomach bo stomach bones. Stomach bonds. Um, special ability, can break or fix anything. <laughs> I love that, can break slash fix anything. I love that because he's, a, he's obviously a handyman, but he also freaking breaks everything. He's really clumsy. Status ally. Ah, oh, Zeus is like a giant anime panda creature that makes the forest grow and lets you sleep on his tummy. That's cute. Wendy, <laughs> love heart, love heart, love heart, love heart. <laughs> <laughs> Distinguishing feature: impossibly cool. Special ability: can create origami with an axe. Status ally. In my mind, Wendy is a warrior princess from the moons of Venus. Venus doesn't have any moons. <laughs> I don't think. Wait, let me research this. There are, however, two planets that do not have any moons at all. These planets are Mercury and Venus. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they they didn't even mean to go that far with the with the joke, but um, that was that's funny in my mind. Wendy is a warrior princess from the moons of Venus. It's just the innocent logic of Mabel uh, and the fact that she doesn't know astrophysics. Little Gideon. Distinguishing feature, giant and frightening white hair, special ability, and admittedly beautiful singing voice. Okay. Status enemy. Good, good, good. Okay. Uh, Robbie, distinguishing feature, his black hair, black hoodie, and black pants. Special ability, making girls like him for no reason whatsoever. True. Status enemy, ally, frenemy. He wears more makeup than I do. Here's... here's the thing, I, I still think Robbie could be revealed to be a zombie, but actually, no, I think that theory's kind of slipping these days because we've seen the zombie apocalypse and they're clearly very different from Robbie. But I think that the theory that Robbie is a zombie was a really cool one because uh, it could have come full loop from the first episode of like, of this guy who, who looks like a normal man, but is actually a zombie. Um, yeah. Candy, distinguishing feature, very thick glasses. Uh, special ability can stare at you without blinking for a really, really long time. Status, Mabel's friends are odd. <laughs> Dipper doesn't appreciate Candy's inner beauty. I've told her she should wear her inner beauty on the outside, but Candy says that her guts would just go spilling out all over. <laughs> oh my God. I actually quite like these characters, even though they're so stupid. So odd. <laughs> uh, and then we got Grenda. Distinguishing feature, that voice. <laughs> that was nothing like Grenda, but that was pretty cool. I did not know I could do that. Um, special ability, I think her entire torso might be one big muscle. <laughs> Status, I'm calling her an ally because I wouldn't want to get on her bad side. Have you seen those arms? When I become president, she's gonna be my bodyguard. <laughs> okay, then we have Mabel. Um, Oh no, <laughs> I've seen what's below. Uh, distinguishing feature, her endless supply of homemade sweaters. They're all homemade? Oh, that's so cute. Special ability, her unique view of life. True. Status, my closest ally and best friend. Oh, that's the cutest thing that's come out of this series so far. Oh, thanks, bro, bro. Here, let me do one for you. Oh no, this could only be bad. Dipper, distinguishing, di distinguishing, distinct, oh wait, oh, I thought she spelt that wrong on purpose, I thought she put another wing wing on, on the end of that, distinguishing feature, that pine tree trucker hat biz, also his squeaky puberty voice, special ability can sneeze like a kitten, Epis uh, call back to episode number three of season one, you sneeze like a kitten. 
no, it wasn't that episode. No, it was. You sneeze like a kitten. Chew. You sneeze like a kitten. No, yeah, I I think that was. Uh, I can't remember. Headhunters. I I thought it was headhunters. Um, status the best brother in the entire world. Although he could stand to shower more. <laughs> I may have to change Mabel's status to enemy. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Is something supernatural or fun going on? What on earth is that? What's going on? <laughs> uh, I know, I know. You're saying, why would I be reading this book if there wasn't something strange going on? Well, the mystery of why your sister takes so long in the bathroom may be hard to solve, but that doesn't mean the answer is outside the laws of nature. Before you can become a master of the paranormal like me, you need to be able to tell the difference between the merely odd and the truly miraculous. So true. Sights, sounds, and smells to watch out for. Out of context, hair odors and strange uh, noises are often mistaken for proof of the supernatural. Ask yourself these hard questions before jumping to conclusions. Hairball, is this definitive evidence that werewolves are invading your town tonight? Um, or is your sh sister shedding? <laughs> Ectoplasmic goo, is that puddle of thick liquid physical residue from a paranormal, paranormal creature or did waddles drool on the floor? <laughs> Ear piercing screech. Is that demon being summoned from the underworld or Robbie screaming out one of his original songs? I love the jokes in this. It's funny. Um, just a random picture of a nose here. Oh, there's an ear here. Okay, fine. Uh, old man McGucket brewing his potions with bricks. Is that like a cinder block? Um, sickening stench. Does the pungent smell of rotten eggs and motor oil mixed with sewage mean you're being visited by a dumpster troll? Or is old man McGucket trying to cook again? Let him cook! <laughs> Ghastly groan. Is this the sound of a tortured soul longing to escape the ghostly afterlife? Or is your grunkle Stan trying to get out of his chair? <laughs> Can that eye-watering stench of rotting heated organic waste be an evil fairy attempting to se seance? Or did your sister just discover perfume? Oh. Very weird addition right here to the bottom of the page. Oh, I guess it. Yeah, fine. Sights. Wait, no, no. S sounds. Smells and sights. Fine. Okay. I thought this was referring to that one page in the in journal three where there are like the floating eyes that's never come into fruition. Um, okay, cool. Um, strange weather we're having or supernatural omen. Astronomer, oh, can you tell which events described below are just weird weather or other astrological events and which is signed to the supernatural? Okay, swirling wings that lift your house off the ground. Swirling wings, winds alone is not supernatural, but if it lifts your house off the ground, that is definitely supernatural because strong winds, hang on. No, actually, I'm wrong. I think because uh, th there have been like devastating tornadoes and stuff that, of course, like essentially lift your house off the ground. And by that, I mean, make your house non-existent. But there you go. Large ice balls that fall like rain. Uh, that is literally just hail <laughs> or sleet uh, or snow, I guess. Uh, there are three suns. That is. Well, no. Well, actually, yes. Yes, there are. Because this isn't capitalized, so, and, and like, if we're saying, okay, actually, no, I, I'm going too far with this. No, there is one sun, but there are multiple stars in our galaxy. <laughs> um, frogs that fall from the sky. I was going to say frogs are not supernatural, but when they fall from the sky, they definitely are. The moon turns blue. Um, that, only, that only ever happens once in a blue moon. Ha <laughs> ha! Um, that was cringe. <clears throat> blood rain. Okay, that happens every blood moon and the sun turns black. That is not supernatural. That is a solar eclipse. Um, oh. Wait, really? Okay, so I gave you some easy ones to start with, but believe it or not, they are all natural events. I'll give you a moment to recompose yourself since I just blew your mind. Wait! <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I got fooled, I got fooled. But most of these I talked about. Um, 
So tornado, they do strange stuff, but twisters are completely natural, yes. Hail, as I said. Did you know that hailstones can get really big? One was 80 pounds? Are you kidding me? Sun dogs or sun ghosts? I haven't heard of this one. When the, sky, when the sun is low in the sky and the right kind of moisture is in the air, it can appear that the sun has multiple of its clones. More on real clones later. Ooh, I want to hear about this. Oh, yeah. I've never heard about this. Um, but I've, of course it makes sense. Um, I guess with refraction. Yeah, okay, because they were saying how moist the air is. And we all know that water reflects light or refracts light um, in a different um, in a different way to, th than air does because of the different, um, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I guess like density of water compared to density of air. Uh, is that what refraction is based off of? I don't freaking know. But if, if the air is more moist, then I, I guess that could be a reason for refraction of of sunlight and stuff like that. Um, so that's cool. Everything else is literally just ghosts. Um, but uh, sun dogs, is that the same thing? Oh, there we go. Oh, that's cool. That's beautiful. Look at that, man. Man, I, <laughs> I want to see some sun dogs. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. So that's what that is. Non-aqueous rain. Fish have also been known to fall like rain. The theory is that tornadoes pass over water, suck up the creatures in the water, and then dump them out later. Legit terrifying, huh? There's no way. There's no way. Blue moon, another trick of the light and water in the sky. Did I say blue moon? I think I did. Yeah, the moon turns blue. Only happens once in a blue moon. Um, the moisture mixes with volcanic ash and forest fire soot to change the color of the moon. Other mixes of the stuff can turn it orange or red. As I said, blood moon. So I, I, I was kind of on the right page. Blood rain. Again, this is just junk like sand or dusts in the air combining with the rainwater. Fair. And then solar eclipse. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, oh, I love this. Wow. There's a page about Bill. Okay. And then Seuss. How to make an eclipse viewer. I know how to do this. Really cool. I've done it before. Um, when we had a solar eclipse once, uh, but it only comes every once in a while. Um, preparing for your supernatural encounter. Ooh. <laughs> okay, let's do this quiz. Let's do these, let's do Dipper's quiz and the Mabel's quiz, and then we're gonna end this video. Uh, if you guys enjoy this type of content where we just literally go through the book and we try and solve codes and we laugh at things, then I would love to do this more. Um, so let me know. Preparing for your supernatural encounter. So you've confirmed that something otherworldly is happening, but are you prepared to confront the supernatural? Test your readiness with this quiz. Okay, here we go. Are you ready for this? A quiz to see if you have what it takes. When I discover a monster living in my refrigerator, I A, scream and run, B, scream and cower in place, C, stifle a scream and reach for the ketchup, D, throw the fridge off a cliff and watch it explode on the rocks below. This is basically fight or flight response, right? Um, isn't there, it's, it's like fight, f fight, flight, or... Um, oh my god, what is it, what's it called? I, I've forgotten, but like, there's, there's another option that is different to fight or flight. Fight or flight, which is where you just stay in place. Um, and I think that's actually me. I think I scream and cower in place. So I'm, I'm going to say B. Okay, I'm going to write this down because I'm going to forget. Uh, the best tool for com combating evil is A, a positive outlook. B, something pointy. C, a journal of the supernatural. D, my bare fists. Well, D is... Uh, <laughs> D is definitely Grunkle Stan. Um, so I, I'm, I'm thinking... I'm thinking this is probably going to be... Uh, four characters and um, and we're going to see what character we are and I would actually say something pointy Journal of the Supernatural although that could be Dipper but I'm going to say something pointy so I got two B's there you go. my attitude towards trouble I'm not going to spoil it for myself my attitude towards trouble is avoid it at all costs avoid it whenever possible to deal with it when it comes my way Trouble better watch out for me. I hate to be that guy, but it's B again. 
Uh, avoid it whenever possible. Obviously, it's it's not going to be possible uh, possible to always avoid trouble. There's always going to be trouble that just comes to you. But like I I'm okay with that. I'm I'm I have come to terms with the fact that I will do things wrong in my life and bad things will happen to me in my life. Um, so I'm not going to avoid it at all costs. But whenever I can, I want to be the best version of me I can be. But obviously, I'm not going to be perfect. So I want to avoid it whenever possible. Um, I'm not going to spoil it. Sorry. I can best be described as a scared kid, a normal kid, a normal kid who can do special things, the best kid for the job. Uh, I'm going to say... I'm going to say A. I think I'm just a scared kid, man. It's a big world out there. Big universe. We are tiny. And I'm scared. I'm really freaking scared. <laughs> but there you go. Uh, and then five. When you're trapped and there's no way out, you think A, ah, B, please, no, no. C, there's always some way out. Or D, whatever's trapped me is in for it now. I'd say C. I'd say I have a pretty uh, positive outlook on that. If I'm trapped, there's there's got to be a way out. There's got to be a way that we can get out. Uh, unless we're in like bedrock okay anyway scoring give yourself one point for each time you answered a two for b so i've got two 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 one and three for c uh, i didn't have any d's uh so six seven ten i had the score of ten let me know in the comments what score did you get i would love to hear what score you got so if you got five to eight points you're scaredy scaredison maybe you should stay home see what's on tv 9 to 12 is Thompson. Come with us, but hang back a little. Oh my gosh. 13 to 16 is investigator material. Sounds like you and me have a lot of comment. Want to join our team? Come on. Come on. Come on, man. I would be so good. You... Literally, Dipper, I... I, Come on. Come on, man. I... What about me? I'm, gonna, I'm getting your hat soon. So, um, I could join your team. I've got that riz. Okay, anyway. 17 to 20 points is the author of Journal 3. Why, well, you must be a superhero. Why are you even reading this book? I should be learning from you. Okay, whatever. Shut up. <laughs> Give me more codes. <laughs> uh, how dumb are Dipper's quizzes? A Mabel quiz about the Dipper quiz you just took. Okay. Everybody, I, I, want, I want you to do this along with me as well. Um... One, Dipper asks about your scream, but Dipper's scream, A, sounds like a nine-year-old girl, B, sounds like a three-year-old girl, C, sounds like a dolphin caught in a net, or D, can only be heard by dogs. Wasn't there a joke in the show that it could only be heard by dogs, or was it something else? I'm going to be nice. Um, I'm going to say a nine-year-old girl. Well, I guess that's it's not really nice, but... <laughs> The best tool for answering Dipper's quiz is a sceptical attitude, something pointy like a pencil, tricking him into answering it for you, or feeding it to the goat. Probably D, to be honest. <laughs> uh, let's just feed it to the goat. My attitude towards question three is it should have been question one. Three questions is already too many to answer it when it comes my way. Three is a magic number, so watch out for its magic powers. Oh, we got some numerology right here. Uh, I'm going to say B, three questions is too many for my short attention span. I need uh, I need some subway surface on the side of this in order to get through this. Four, I can best describe Dipper's quiz as something dumb for dummies. Yeesh. A page in a book. I'd rather not describe the quiz. Taking it is boring enough. Um, I'd say probably something dumb for dummies. <laughs> Uh, you are at question five and the quiz maker has run out of questions. A, woohoo. B, yes, can I go now? C, C is always the right answer, so I'll answer C. Or D, perfect, I've run out of answers. Let me say C. C is always what you go for. It's number three out of four. Scoring. Give yourself one point for each time you answer. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Then give yourself as many points as you want. Congrats, you're now a wizard. That's really funny. Oh, that, that, that actually got me. 
All right. Well, this book is really cool so far. Uh, again, I want to do more of this and I'm sure you want to see me do more of this. So make sure you give this video a big fat thumbs up and let me know in the comments. If you want more of this, make sure you subscribe too. Next up on the channel, we're going to be doing another Gravity Falls reaction video. And I've heard from multiple sources that the next two episodes, and yes, I am going to be doing two episodes only, the next two episodes are wild. So I cannot wait to get into that. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you then. Goodbye.